Hello, everybody. We're just going to wait uh, one minute to let everyone log in, get settled, and um, hear the program that is getting started. <laughs> All right, I still see a few attendees that are logging in, so we'll just give them another minute. And I just had a friend oh. find me. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, a young gardener. A very young gardener, yes. So, you and know. I hear you're doing another rain garden, so he looks like he could help with digging. Mm -hmm. Yes, we he had a lot of fun in the mud digging our <laughs> rain garden last summer, <laughs> which I'm sure you're all here to hear about. Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and kick this off. So, welcome everyone. My name is Beth Gabriel. I work at the East Branch Library, and we're here with Melinda Myers today to talk about how to select rain garden plants. Um, also in the background is my esteemed colleague, Lydia, who is with the Tippy Can Do Library. <laughs> <laughs> and we will both be in the background during the presentation. I'm sorry, you're bored, but I'm working. So you go ahead and sit down for a second. There'll be some time for Q&A at the presentation end. So just put your questions in the Q&A and we'll have the handout there for you too. All right, I'm gonna kick it over to Melinda and you just let us know if you have any questions or technical concerns. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Beth, and to your young assistant and Lydia. I always love working with the library. They're such wonderful folks to work with. And if there are technical problems, we have assistance. So welcome. I'm so glad you're joining me. And this is a fun part for me. I don't know about you, but I spend a lot of time looking at catalogs and websites, ordering plants, deciding what to order, going to my garden center with a long list. And if you're in the Milwaukee Metro Sewage District, you need to get busy and put your rain garden plant order in place. And if you're not, the good news is more and more garden centers are carrying these native plants we'll discuss. And you can also find them online at reliable sources as well. Um, I want to thank Fresh Coast Guardians and Milwaukee Metro Sewage District for sponsoring this webinar. Because of their sponsorship, we can be here together at no fee. And um, their goal is to help us capture rainwater, keep it on our landscape where it can help support our plants and out of the storm sewers and out of our basements as well. And then, of course, Milwaukee Public Library uh, for sponsoring or for hosting the event. Um, libraries are near and dear to many of our hearts, a center for the community to gather resources for materials, books, and, and just um, opportunities galore. So I wanna thank them for hosting tonight's event. So let's get started, selecting rain garden plants. So when you're looking to select rain garden plants, this is a unique situation. As always, we want the right plant for the growing conditions, but rain gardens are gonna be subject to flooding because when we get lots of rain, it's gonna collect that rainwater and slowly drain within 12 to 24 hours. So that soil is gonna stay soggy wet for a while. And then if we have a dry spell like we did last summer, you want plants that tolerate the drought so you're not out there watering ever every week. Now, until the plants are established, you are going to have to provide some supplemental, provide some supplemental water during those dry periods. But once they're established after a couple years, most are going to tolerate whatever normal weather is these days. We always want to make sure the plants are hardy. All the plants that I'm covering tonight and in the handout, and there are some plants in the handout that I'm not discussing, but they're good plants to use in the rain garden. So I thought I'd just leave them in there from the past so that you maybe decide to buy them on your own. These are plants that are all tolerant, <clears throat> excuse me, all hardy to central to southern Wisconsin throughout much of the Midwest, even parts of the south and colder northern areas. So check that hardiness rating in the handout as well when we go through. The other thing besides the moisture tolerance, we want to look at sunshade conditions. And I think this is always a struggle when you read about full sun part sunshade. Um, and you want to evaluate that sun throughout the day because you know that changes. And you know, when we all went to work, I don't know if you still go and leave your home every day, but you may leave and your front yard's in shade and you come back and it's shade and you assume it was shady all day when in reality it was pretty bright intense sunlight for part of that time. So evaluating the sunshade patterns 
throughout the year and throughout the day. When I lived in the city of Milwaukee, my neighbor's house was only like eight feet away. And that was the south side. And it was pretty shaded by her house. And I really planned on shade tolerant plants. And lo and behold, I had a few leftover okra plants that liked full sun and some salvia. And I thought, well, I have nowhere else to put them. I put them there and was amazed they did well. The okra even flowered and produced okra for eating. And the salvias bloomed quite well. So what I didn't realize while I was gone all day is that it had enough bright indirect light all day long to support those plants. So you may be surprised that you can kind of stretch the limits a bit. But I also know gardeners stretch the limits. So in most literature you read about, they talk about full sun being six hours, but I tell you eight because I know we're all gardeners and we're going to push the limits. So we want to make sure that um, we get that full day of sunlight. Now that could be an east exposure during the peak of summer when the sun's up early and lasts throughout the midday, but it may not be um, a west exposure if you have a house next to you or uh, tree shading that. So monitor that and record those hours and see where the sunlight falls. Part shade is usually three to five hours of direct sunlight. Part sun, part shade and east location is really good. It's mild sunlight. Think about how much cooler it is in the morning. A west location, even just a west with half day sun, really you could probably push some full sun plants into that location. And shade gets three hours of direct sun or maybe bright indirect light all day. What I like to do is what I call indicator plants. So I know if this plant grows in this location, it gets enough sun for it to flower and do well, then these other plants that require similar sunlight conditions will also thrive. So something to keep in mind. If you joined me last week, you saw this display, but I think it's the best way to explain how soil works. Clay soils made of particles that are flat like plates and they collect the moisture in between. So they hold moisture a long time. Great during dry periods, but not so much during wet periods. They tend to stay wet even longer and drain slowly, as you can see here. Loam soils are a mixture of these flat clay-like particles. Silt particles that are in between sand and clay size and clay and sand particles that are much larger. It drains well, holds moisture. It's kind of the ideal soil. And sandy soil, as you can see, drains quickly. That's what I'm gardening in right now. So it's been a big change, but the large particles let water drain quickly. It doesn't hold on to nutrients as well. Last week, we talked about amending the soil and we'll revisit that again in May when I talk about how to plant your rain garden. I also wanted to mention, I'm gonna throw in a few ornamental plants because I find often we plan these gardens and sometimes people are disappointed because you're getting nothing but leaves that first year from your plant until it gets established. So we'll talk about some ways to cheat and add some color. When you're selecting plants, look for those that have bird and pollinator appeal. Um, rain gardens, we're going to talk about native plants, and they've evolved with the uh, insects and the birds. So they're providing a good food source and homes for these desirable insects and birds. Not only do the birds uh, add color and motion and they feed on the seeds of many of the plants, but they also eat a lot of insect pests helping to manage. And those beneficial insects, pollinator plants, some are predators that kill insect pests. So all of that is to, going to help not only your rain garden, but your landscape. And year-round interest. Um, if you're in the north like me, winters can be long and gray. And so having perennials like you see here that have some color and motion seed heads for the winter can really add a lot of interest to the garden, as well as attracting those birds that add more color and motion. I think I took this picture at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. Um, and botanic gardens and arboretum are great places to go to get ideas. You'll notice that we're going to cover some grasses and sedges, and they're not the bright, colorful flowering plants, but they do have interesting seed heads. They provide motion, and they also provide support for some of those flowering plants called forbs so they don't flop over. If you've grown New England aster and you haven't pinched it back or had a sturdy neighbor nearby, you know it flops over. And they also provide unity. This was at the National Arboretum. 
and our National Botanic Garden and Arboretum. And you look at the grass plants, our little blue stem, the amber plants are willow amsoni, and then of course the purple are uh, New England asters. But you notice that grass just carries your eye throughout the planting. As we go through each plant, you'll see these icons at the bottom um, so that it might grab your attention and go, okay, I like that. I want hummingbirds. I wanna make sure to include this. This information is on your handout as well. Um, I spent a lot of time putting that handout together so you'd have a good resource as you plan your plant selection. So let's start the season. I'm going from full sun plants and we'll go to part sun plants and we'll go to shade tolerant plants from short to tall. And bloom times are at the bottom as well. So starting off this season in May and June is a short plant called prairie smoke. And this is in one of my garden beds. I use this as an edger. The leaves are only about six inches tall. In bloom, it's about a foot high. You'll notice the flowers are sort of nodding pink bell-shaped flowers add a lot of interest early in the season. And then once mature, those wispy smoke-like seed heads form and persist for quite a while. The leaves look great all season long. It reseeds, but not overly aggressive. Um, I think this clump started as one plant and that was probably 10 years ago, eight or 10 years ago. So it's tripled or quadrupled in size. And then I've moved a few seedlings to other areas in the garden. It's great for the edge of your rain garden because of the low size, the low height. It's also tolerant of dry soils. So when you think about your rain garden, the lowest point is going to be the wettest. So you're going to want plants that tolerate the wet. The upper edges are the place for those that take mesic, which means normal, warm, wet, dry, kind of like moderate moisture, moderate drought. If it's wet mesic like this, it'll take it a little on the wetter side. If it's dry mesic, it'll tolerate a little drier. If it's dry, it really tolerates dry. Landsleep coreopsis or tick seed, wonderful plant. The pollinators love those flowers. And when the seeds form, you'll see goldfinches and other songbirds munching on the seeds. It grows one to two feet tall. So it's a nice size for most landscapes. Landsleep, landsleep if you look at those leaves, they're nice and narrow. So it adds kind of a light texture to the garden and it blooms June, July. So it's got a good early start to the season. I find sometimes June is a hard month to find things that are in color. So this is a good addition. It likes it dry and it will take moisture, normal, whatever that is, moisture conditions, moderate moisture to dry conditions. So a good choice, again, for those, not at the bottom, but the side areas of your rain garden where it may be a little moist, but tend to be drier. Harebell. These look very delicate, but they're really tough plants. The hummingbirds love these. These again are summer bloomers, and you can see by its surrounding, it's very drought tolerant. So it can take slight moisture, but really prefers well-drained to dry soils. That blue is something that gardeners are always looking for. And so those spikes of blue flowers will really brighten up your garden. Again, it takes it dry. So this is perfect around the drier spots parts of your rain garden that um, are going to drain quickly and not hold as much moisture as the center. Prairie uh, clover is one of my favorites. Very unique looking flowers. Look at it. The pollinators love this. The dissected leaves, you can kind of see a bit of the foliage in there, um, really add some nice texture. Again, these are about one to two feet tall um, and they like it mesic, so moderate moisture, moderate drought to dry conditions. Now these are clover and they're deep rooted. They have a long tap root. So you wanna plant this where you can leave it because it can be difficult to move once it's established. Or if you put it in this year and decide to move it, move it next year before it gets too established. Um, I have some plants sometimes I always say, I plant them where I want it, they grow where they decide, and then I just change my garden around it if I need to. And this might be one of them. But those beautiful flowers are mid to late summer, great for the pollinators. So as that lance leaf coreopsis fades, this one kicks in. 
Um, purple love grass. I have this one growing in my garden as well, um, towards the front of the bed. And you can kind of see the grass blades are a little bit coarse. So don't be alarmed. You might want to put it in an area where that coarse texture is welcome. When I first grew it a few years ago, I was like, what did I plant here? But as soon as those flowers come out, those beautiful pink, light, airy flowers really soften the texture and those broad, coarser leaves really um, become a nice backdrop for them. This is another one that likes it dry, nice, light, and airy. And so it's great texture for around the edge of the garden or in between those things like the prairie clover that or the landsleaf coreopsis. So it can provide some nice airy texture next to them. Wild petunia. If this one is happy, you will have a lot of it. I planted this in my city garden. I have a, had a back alley garden and boy, it took over. I had a small city lot and I wasn't expecting it to be the ground cover for that garden bed, but that's a perfect use for it. And if you look at this planting, you can see what I call as a weaver, it kind of wanders around the bigger plants like the grass plants you see here and some of the larger upright forbs. So this is a good ground cover. It takes it moist to dry, so it probably will not survive in the bottom or the deepest part of your rain garden, but it could form a nice ground cover around the outer edge. It blooms nonstop for a long period of time, really without deadheading. Um, I'm now in have more space and I need to get this plant in a few garden beds so that I can crowd out the weeds with something that will really perform well. So they say the it's one to two feet. I think that depends a lot on your soil. I found it mostly under a foot tall for me. Sweet grass. Now I've read some things that this can be very aggressive. So you might want to keep an eye on it in your rain garden. You may just need to dig and divide and move those extra plants to other areas or start a second rain garden. The foliage, the leaves are fragrant. So that's where it gets that name sweet grass. And look at those attractive seed heads. So they're nice and bold. So really going to add some interest to that early season garden. Now these are plants that will take it wet. And they're one to three feet tall. So you could put these on the side or even the bottom of your rain garden. Now, one thing you're going to discover as you plant your rain garden, you may have to move plants around based on how they're performing. And remember that old saying, the first year they sleep, the second year they creep, the third year they leap. So the first year, those plants are putting down roots for the long haul. And as frustrating as it is for you to see that little plant not getting three times bigger that first year, um, be patient. Once it's rooted, it will take off. Showy goldenrod. A couple reasons I like this. I like goldenrod in this one in particular, one to three feet tall. Um, it prefers more uh, soils on the drier side. It is one of the less aggressive goldenrods. And if you've grown goldenrod, you know they can reseed readily and they can take over a garden quickly. This is one that tends to spread slowly and not be overly aggressive. Golden rods are great because they provide nectar and pollen for late season insects that may be migrating or those that may be hibernating. I have a showy golden rod um, in the back and boy, every fall it is covered with bees just like you see here. Knocks your socks off, that bright yellow really grabs your attention, combines nicely with purple asters for a really stunning display. And again, it tolerates those drier conditions, so moist to dry, so along the edges to the outer edge of your rain garden. Sky blue aster, look at that beautiful blue. It's a nice tall aster. Um, asters can tend to flop. We can prune them back um, throughout the month of June to about six inches to encourage more compact growth. Um, sky blue aster um, can um, is a little more upright and stiffly upright. And as you look at it here, it's really holding its own. Um, it takes it mesic to dry, so it's dry soil tolerant. This is not in my garden, that is not my barberry, but if you've grown barberry, which now we've discovered are invasive, you know it tolerates dry soil. So that might remind you that this one's good drought tolerance. Um, birds love the seeds of the asters. We often don't enjoy those asters. I was out taking pictures of some asters in one of my garden beds today for an article. And boy, those fuzzy seed heads um, that the birds have left are still very attractive, adding some brightness to my 
late winter garden. And of course, pollinators love the flowers. Butterfly weed, and here it's, it's with purple cone flower. Um, you can see some helianthus on the right and prairie drop seed is the grass in front. This is at Retzer Nature Center in Waukesha. Um, a couple of reasons I like butterfly weed. Butterfly weed is not as aggressive as common milkweed and the monarch caterpillars will feed on the leaves. Common milkweed is their favorite, but if you've grown common milkweed, you know it spreads by underground rhizomes that are like six, eight inches or more deep, so it's hard to manage. Yes, you can pluck off those seed pods before they open so it won't spread by seed, but those rhizomes really make it a very aggressive plant. Butterfly weed, on the other hand, um, tolerates dry soil, is more of a clumper, and doesn't spread so readily by seed or underground roots. Um, I, when I was growing this in my heavier soil in the city, I found I'd plant it where I wanted, it kind of grew where it chose to. Now I'm in sandy soil and these things do great. So if you have clay soil, just keep in mind, it'll take a while, put them in a drier portion of your garden, they're not going to tolerate that wet center. But those bright orange flowers combine nicely with blues and purples, and they really brighten up and add just um, an element of color that's so welcome. And when you have milkweed, any of the milkweed, watch for hummingbirds as well as butterflies and bees nectaring on the flowers and all kinds of butterflies as well as the monarch. Side Oats Grandma, take a look at those seed heads and flowers on this. They sometimes call this eyelash grass because it looks like eyelashes. Uh, there's been some uh, breeding going on and some people don't like native ours and native ours are cultivars of our native plants sometimes been selected for maybe a little different flowering but a lot of times just for more compact growth. Um, our native species obviously are the best for supporting pollinators but may not fit in all garden situations. Side oats grandma isn't overly aggressive. The flowers are in seed heads because of the angle they hang from this, the flower stems just really add an interesting element to the garden. And it's again, one that tolerates dry soil. So use it around the sides or the upper edges of your rain garden. Rough Blazing Star or Liatris. Liatris are great plants. I'm going to see several different ones. A um, couple things. Um, hummingbirds will nectar on the flowers. Butterflies love them. And if you let the seed heads develop, which is a good idea for the hardiness of the plant and the pollinators and the birds, the birds will come and feed on the seeds. You may find liatris in the florist coolers because they make great cut flowers. The cool thing about this plant, unlike most plants, the flowers mature from the top down. In most plants, they open at the bottom and continue to the top. So just kind of a fun thing to watch. These do reseed readily. Um, um, we had liatris growing in our uh, city lot, and I think we helped to fill this county parks because my ex-husband worked for the county. So he'd take these cone flowers, rudbeckias, and, and share them with the parks department. We did not have jumping worms, so it was all good. These are tall plants, provide great vertical accent in the garden. Showy black-eyed Susan. Now this is one that is great for rain gardens because it takes it wet to dry. So this is one that really can be towards the center of your rain garden. You know, I love black-eyed Susan and the Fulgida speciosa is resistant to leaf spot. So if you grew goldstrom, you probably had problems with leaf spot disease. This one's taller, two to four feet tall, long period of bloom. And those yellow flowers not only will attract pollinators and hummingbirds and bees and butterflies, but your neighbors as well. I find the Rudbeckias were the ones that always made people stop and go, wow, what a beautiful garden. So how can you not be happy when you look at these cherry plants? Greatest cut flowers, leave most of them in the garden, but cut a few. Um, and the seed heads are attractive in dried arrangements and really a pretty in the winter garden and provide food for the songbirds. Smooth blue asters is another one that tolerates some 
um, drier conditions. It is another one that tends to stand upright on its own. Notice it's nice and tall and upright. Um, a late season bloomer and nice and tall. Um, again, if you surround your asters with grasses, I think it's a nice combination from texture, but also making sure those plants have the support they need so that you don't have to get out there and cut them back early in the season. Um, the flat flowers of asters and rudbeckia and coneflower are perfect for butterflies and bees because they provide a landing pad that they can rest upon while they lap up the nectar and grab some pollen to spread from plant to plant. Now we're going to talk about two vervain. Hoary vervain is the one that tolerates dry conditions and full sun. So if you have fast draining soils, this is the vervain to choose. This is the one I added to my native garden because I have very sandy soil and it's in an area that once they're established, they are on their own because it's hard to get water out to the planting. They're tall plants, beautiful kind of a lavender blue flower, nice vertical accent. They tend to be narrow and upright. They will get larger over time, but um, very narrow and upright. When you look at the spacing on your handout, you may go, wow, almost all of these are being spaced at one, one and a half, at the most two or three feet apart. You're starting with, typically we're starting with smaller plants. We're putting them in you know, conditions that can be a little challenging. And the idea here is if they outgrow the spot, you can dig, divide, and start a new garden elsewhere. This is one of my favorite natives, and that would be my garden you're looking at um, early in the season, um, doing some protection from the animals there with row cover. Um, here's why I like false blue indigo. It's a big plant, and make sure you leave room, which I probably underestimated the size and need to move a few plants around it. The blue-green leaves had beautiful interest. It's an early season bloomer, so great for pollinators and hummingbirds looking for a food source. Um, once the flowers are done, they're replaced with black pods. I read somewhere that um, pioneers used to use them as rattles with their kids. I don't know. I could see my grandkids just eating them and putting them in their mouth. So I probably wouldn't do that. I like the look of those black pods against the blue green leaves and leave them on the plant. In the winter, after the seed pods have opened and the wind blows, it's kind of like a wooden chimes noise. When I was out cleaning out my garden in the late winter, it was great. Um, if they tend to flop, it might be they're not getting enough sun. You can prune them back to a third and that will encourage more compact growth, but then you miss the seed pods. So it's just a trade-off, compact plant, seed pods. And again, if they're in full sun, they'll do fine. These take moist soils um, to dry soils. And um, again, you might be able to push them into the center of the rain garden, especially if you have good drainage. Showy milkweed. Um, one of the reasons uh, milkweed is great, this is less aggressive than the common milkweed. Look at those beautiful flowers. Again, milkweeds are attractive to hummingbirds, pollinators, and this is a great one for full sun and less aggressive than common milkweed, but still has that pollinator appeal. It's a tall one like common milkweed, three to four feet tall, but beautiful flowers that um, sometimes we miss because we don't look at them close up. Swamp milkweed, as the name implies, it tolerates wet soil. I see a lot of people calling it red milkweed. I think maybe they feel it will sell better. But um, it's got fragrant pink flowers, uh, smooth leaves, and I find it's not as aggressive as common milkweed. I have had some people say it reseeds, so just pluck off those seed pods before they open if you're concerned about that. But I find they're more of clumpers. They're not those that spread aggressively like common milkweed. A great plant for pollinators. The monarch caterpillars will feed upon the leaves and it's great in full sun. I'm an excellent plant, tolerates wet soil, but will also tolerate it dry. So a good one for the center of your rain garden. Pale purple coneflower, you probably all know purple coneflower, the most popular of our native plants. Pale purple coneflower 
blooms earlier and is a little more adaptable, more tolerant of dry soils. So when we get to purple coneflower, we'll talk about it taking mesic wet to mesic dry, where this one likes mesic to dry. So this is one if dry soils are an issue, this will survive better than your purple or tolerate better than your purple coneflower. Um, I find it spreads, but not as aggressively as the purple coneflower and those narrow petals give it a different kind of look to your landscape. All the good attributes of purple coneflower plus a little more adaptable and blooms a little earlier. I'm not saying you need to choose. I use both in my gardens. You'll probably want to as well. Another uh, Liatris, Meadow Blazing Star. This one's even taller. And this one is probably, according to Prairie Nursery's owner, the most appealing for monarch butterflies. This really is a magnet for monarch butterflies to nectar upon. They'll nectar on milkweed flowers and a variety of others, but they seem to really like this. It has all the same attributes as the other. It's a little more moisture tolerant, so it tolerates wet and dry perfect for the center of your rain garden. Um, full sun for best results. Um, again, the birds will eat the seeds, the butterflies, hummingbirds, and bees will uh, nectar on the flowers. Nice vertical accent. Stiff goldenrod. Now, stiff goldenrod can spread by seed. So if it's getting a little too, um, if it's kind of moving in where you don't want it, consider deadheading, removing the flowers as they fade. The pollinators will be done with them or leave a few so that you'll have some seeds for the songbirds, kind of a half and half thing maybe so you can control the spread. Um, it takes it wet to dry. So again, great for the center of your rain garden, three to five feet tall. So even in that indentation, it's gonna stand nice and tall. And like your other golden rods, it provides pollen and nectar for for our um, insects um, that are migrating or hibernating. Um, just a, a word about goldenrod and allergies in case you're new to gardening or you've read some of the reports that it causes hay fever, it does not. Goldenrod has heavy pollen that drops to the ground. It's the neighbor ragweed that has green flowers that is often overlooked because of its showy neighbor that causes hay fever. It's light pollen goes in the air and that's what causes hay fever. So don't have to worry about hay fever and allergies from goldenrod. Again, great cut flowers as well as good for the pollinators and the birds. Early sunflower, Heliopsis helianthoides. This is one that tends to stand upright. Some of the Heliopsis need to be pruned early in the season to keep them from flopping over. This one tends to hold itself up high. It's tall, three to six uh, feet tall. And again, it will tolerate wet and dry soil. So perfect for the center of your rain garden. One is it's going to really be a nice focal point. It's tall enough so it will overlook the edges, those plants along the edges, and it will tolerate that flooding and drought. These daisy-like flowers um, are wonderful uh, for pollinators and the seeds help feed the birds. We have a cultivar of this at our state fair garden and it does reseed readily. Um, and so we need to do a little digging, dividing every few years just to keep it in line, but not too hard to manage. And here you can see some wild bergamot, the purple weaving in and out equally assertive plants. And that's important when you're planning your garden so that they can kind of duke it out and you'll still have two equally assertive plants at the end. Now this blue vervain is the one that likes it moist. So this is one you could use in the center of your rain garden, or if you have heavy clay soils that, that stay wet longer. Just like the other one, it's got nice blue flowers, blue lavender flowers, good vertical interest in the garden, tends to be a more narrowly upright than some plants, um, mid to late summer bloomer. And again, it takes it wet. So it's a good one for the center of the garden that's gonna stay wet longer. Just like the hoary vervain, it does attract hummingbirds, butterflies, and other pollinators. Now we're moving to part shade, sun to part shade. So some of these would do great in sun, but will tolerate a half a day of sun. So wild strawberries, um, this one's a fun one because it's a great ground cover. It likes it dry to wet, so perfect and throughout 
that garden, rain garden as a ground cover to help combat weeds and kind of weave around some of your larger plants. White flowers in the spring, edible fruit. They're tiny, but they're nice and sweet. So you and the birds will have to duke it out. And then red fall color. So it's got seasonal interest as well. And some of the leaves will persist through the winter. Nodding pink onion. Um, if you've grown any of the alliums, you know most of them reseed readily, and this is no exception. This is a wonderful plant, and the good news is it's easy to identify in the spring, because one of the challenges in the spring is as you're weeding out grass weeds, uh, allium leaves tend to be thicker, they're hollow in the center, but boy, just break one and you can smell that oniony fragrance. So you know if you need to thin them out and move them because you have too many of these nodding pink onions. They're great. They have grass-like leaves that look great all season. They bloom for two months in the summer. Um, you can remove the seed heads if you want to control the spread of these, if you're tired of weeding out the seedlings or run out of room to move them from one place to the next. These are great in the center of the rain garden, really about anywhere in your rain garden because they tolerate it wet and they tolerate it dry. Great pollinator plants as well. Wild lupine, native to central and northern Wisconsin and other areas in the country. Um, I've grown the Russell hybrid lupine in my garden and really struggled with them because they really like cool weather and they did great when the weather was cool. These bloom early in the season, but these are much more tolerant to our normal weather, though they'll be spectacular when we have that cool spring and start to the growing season. Their beautiful flowers are excellent for hummingbirds, butterflies. They are in the legume family, just like Baptisia, the wild false blue indigo, I forgot to mention, are both in the pea family. So they fix um, atmospheric nitrogen and add it to the soil to help support them as well as other plants. So that's a real plus for this one. Nice looking leaves, um, blooms early in the season, like it on the dry side. Yarrow. You will see this plant listed in weed books, perennial books, and um, catalogs. Now I used to really um, kind of go, oh, don't put yarrow in the garden, it will take over. But you know what, if you're using other native plants that are equally assertive, what I've been seeing in prairie plantings where they're using common yarrow, that the other plants keep it somewhat in check. You'll notice that it's got that fine ferny foliage and that smell that yarrow has. And you can see a little bit of that foliage kind of towards the center of your screen. So that makes it easy to identify in the spring. So if you've got lots of seedlings coming up, you can easily dig those tusks them in the compost pile if you don't have a place to put them in another garden. Um, but these bloom throughout the summer, readily blooming. You can do a little deadheading if they're starting to fade out. Um, just keep an eye on them because they do spread, but this will take dry conditions very well. And again, equally assertive to some of those more aggressive plants. So let them duke it out and they'll do fine. Brown fox sedge. This one has some nice bronzy seed heads that add to it. It has a growth habit similar to prairie drop seed that you'll see later, kind of like fountain grass, if you know annual fountain grass, but this is a perennial. It takes it wet, it takes it dry. So this is a good one to weave anywhere throughout your garden. Again, the leaves look like a grass. They take full to part sun and they only grow a couple feet tall. So I like to use sedges and grasses throughout my garden beds because they always fill those spaces well. They make a nice airy texture as a backdrop for some of those bolder flowers like cone flowers, um, wild quinine, some rudbeckias, some of those nice bolder flowers. This is just a nice backdrop. And speaking of bold flowers and rudbeckia, black-eyed Susan, this is truly a biennial. And biennials are plants that put up leaves the first year. The next year, they put up more leaves, flower, reseed, and die. But rudbeckia herda reseeds so readily that it acts like a perennial, and you never knew it was a biennial. Um, sometimes called gloriosa daisy, nice flat petals, that deep brown center. Um, 
that flat flower top is perfect for butterflies and, and pollinators. The seeds, you'll find birds eating the seeds throughout the winter. Um, I like to leave my seed, my plant stand as long as possible for the pollinators. But tomorrow night, I'm talking bird gardening. And think about what's in your yard in spring. There's not a lot of food for them. The berries and the seeds aren't out on many plants. So leaving your garden and these seed heads stand as long as possible provides food for them when they really need it. Uh, this Rudbeckia grows one to three feet tall. The good news is it doesn't get leaf spot. If you don't know what Rudbeckia leaf spot is, that's good. That means you didn't have the problem. If you have had it, this one is a good option for you because it's resistant. Great blue lobelia. This is a late season bloomer. Blue flowers, it forms a dense colony, but it is manageable. If you've grown cardinal flower, and we'll talk about that in a minute, um, you know, it can be a little finicky. I find great blue lobelia is a lot easier to grow. It has the same hummingbird appeal as cardinal flower. Granted, it's not that knock your socks off red of cardinal flower, but it's longer lived. So it's late season. So it's providing some color in your garden, providing pollen for uh, hummingbirds and butterflies and pollinating insects and easier to grow. And I find if it just outgrows its spot, it's easy to dig, divide and use those divisions somewhere else. Now, lead plant isn't for those of you in a hurry for results. It can take several years for this plant to mature and it forms almost a woody base. So the first few years, do not cut this plant back. Let it get established. After that, you can prune it back as need be. But the leaves are kind of a gray green, which is hard to see here because they have some pubescence or hairs on the leaves. So they really stand out among that green. And those spikes of purple, purple flowers appear June and July. It likes it, you know, moderately moist, dry to dry soil conditions. Um, I put some of these in my garden last year, so um, I need to be patient, <laughs> waiting for them to reach full size and bloom, but it's definitely worth, worth the wait. New Jersey tea, the first time I saw this was in um, Oh, actually in a wooded area in central Wisconsin, and it was a little bit marshy as well. So New Jersey tea is a shrub, so it forms a woody base. It does flowers, you can see July and August. And if you look at those tubular flowers, you know they're perfect for butterflies and hummingbirds, and the pollinators will visit them as well. Um, it's two to three feet tall. It provides a little bit of structure, and look at how it combines nicely with the grasses. It just kind of adds some bold texture relief from the fine texture of that grass. Foxglove penstemon. This is a bloomer earlier in the season. And this picture, I think um, I took at Lurie Garden in Millennial Park in Chicago, a great place to go to look for plant combination ideas. They use cultivate as well as native plants. But foxglove penstemon is one of the penstemons that not only tolerates relatively dry soil, but also moist. Most penstemon like it dry. So this is excellent for clay soils. Excellent for hummingbirds um, and butterflies and bees. I've even pushed this into the shade. It doesn't flower as well in heavier shade, but definitely tolerates a half day of shade. Look at how tall they stand among those other plants. So nice vertical interest does develop into a nice dense colony over time, but those spires of white flowers are attractive for you to look at as well as the pollinators and humming, hummingbirds. So again, two to three feet tall takes it a little on the moist side. So maybe not right at the bottom of your rain garden, but up in that area where it's starting to be a bit drier. Wood mint, I have to say, is a new plant for me. Um, I have not grown this one, I must confess. Um, it does form dense colonies, as you can see here, a little more subtle on the bloom, but the pollinators do find their way into to that plant. Tolerates that wet soil condition, so a good one for the bottom of your rain garden. Two to four feet tall, full sun for best flowering, but it will take some half day of shade and still bloom for you. As you can see it's a much taller kind of more casual looking plant um, that takes up some space so you may need to do a little digging and dividing to keep it in line. 
our native little blue stem. This is back at Lurie Garden. If you have rich soils, little blue stem, ten, blue stem tends to flop. Um, so put some coneflower next to it or rudbeckias or some of those more upright, stronger plants to help hold it upright. It's got blue green foliage in the summer. It turns kind of an orange in the fall. The seed heads are pink and white. It's just a kaleidoscope of colors and the seeds are attractive for songbirds. You'll find pollinators nectaring on the flowers and it just adds some nice color and texture to the garden all throughout the growing season and into winter. Um, so don't be alarmed if it flops for you. That's typical in rich, heavy soils. Um, so just give it some good sturdy neighbors to keep it upright. Um, prairie drop seed, I mentioned that um, fox brown fox sedge looks similar in growth habit. The reason I like prairie drop seed is it's easy to combine with native, natural, informal, and even formal gardens. If you know what, fountain grass is hardy or annual, it's got that similar growth habit. And so it fits nicely into gardens, just like you'd use the more ornamental fountain grass. But this is perennial and hardy, I think to zone three. It has green leaves all summer long that turn a yellow, a beigey orange in the fall. The flowers appear at the end of the season and they smell to me like burnt popcorn, but some people say coriander. And then when the seed pods form and the ice forms on them, they look like gems in the garden. So you have four seasons of interest with this plant. Look at how nicely it combines with the butterfly weed. Now it can get to be two to three feet tall and wide. So if it's happy, it will be taller and heavier soils. It tends to be a little shorter, but it grows great and heavy as well as well-drained soil. So a good plant for the sides of your rain garden or outer edge. Blue wood aster, more shade tolerant than many of the asters, also tolerates, it prefers moist soil, but will tolerate it dry as well. Again, another late season bloomer. Those clusters of daisy-like flowers really add interest to the fall garden, late summer and fall garden. Lavender hyssop. This one reseeds readily. Um, this is one of my favorite plants. It's also called anise hyssop because if you rub the leaves, it smells like licorice or anise. It reseeds readily, which some people find annoying. I find it's great because it's filling those spaces. But I have some of these planted on a hillside garden in my yard, and I was out taking pictures, and I was standing amongst several um, lavender hyssop plants, and they were loaded with bees, with the silver spotted skipper, with uh, swallowtail butterflies flies. I tried to take video of it just to share, but I, I couldn't share that experience of standing amongst these flowers with all these pollinators. It was great. Birds will come in and clean up the seeds, but they usually leave plenty to re, for the plant to reseed. So it's a wonderful plant, long bloomer. It combines nicely. I have mine growing with some Cheyenne spirit coneflower. I have it with wild quinine, with rattlesnake master, with some grasses and sedges. So it's a wonderful plant that's very adaptable. It, it reseeds, so just be prepared to thin it as needed. Mountain mint. This is a great one for those wet areas. It's not in the menth of, it's not a true mint. Look at the narrow leaves. So even when it's not blooming, it's adding nice texture to the plant, or to the garden early in the season. And so those combine nicely with some of those things like the tick seed and the rudbeckia. And then that cluster of white blooms, white flowers are excellent in the evening garden, right? They just shine. And so if you tend to spend more time in your landscape at night, or this is a rain garden you're going to enjoy in the evening and the night, white flowers are great additions because they really stand out. This one's two to three feet tall. And again, another one, when you see wet to mesic, perfect for those wetter portions of the rain garden. Now, cardinal flower can be grown in water gardens, can be grown on shorelines, can be grown in terrestrial plantings and rain gardens. They are short-lived perennials and I find can be challenging. So if you've grown and killed this a few times, don't give up, try again. Spires of red flowers that are really outstanding in the garden, really grab your attention and draw those hummingbirds and pollinators to the garden. If you've tried and failed, don't worry. 
a friend of mine who has a huge, beautiful prairie planting has one cardinal flower growing in the midst of it. She goes, it never grows anymore. It never spreads. She has one. Doesn't matter what she does. She just can't get it to take over. So there one cardinal flower greets her throughout the summer. Wild bergamot in the Monarda group. So you may know Monarda. Um, bee bomb is another name for this group of plants. This is the native that grows from July through September and it blooms. It tolerates it wet to dry. This one is more shade tolerant and um, it gets some powdery mildew, but not as bad as some of the others. Um, it will grow and spread. It spreads by roots and it also spreads by seed. But I find it's aromatherapy. So when you go out in your garden and you thin out the planting, and you remove some of those unwanted seedlings, they have that citrusy minty fragrance, so it smells real good. Used to make um, Oswego tea, um, hummingbirds, butterflies, and bees love this plant, and the birds feed on the seeds. Purple coneflower, I won't mention a lot because this is a plant most of you probably know, if not, it's a great native plant, um, popular because it's a great cut flower, great for pollinators. Hummingbirds will nectar on the flower. The seeds will uh, feed the birds over winter. One um, wholesale grower said, it seems like you feel like that every seed sprouts two plants. They don't. It just seems that way. But boy, they're a great source of food for the birds over winter and into spring. And again, just thin out those unwanted seedlings. As you get started, leave some tags by your plants to help you identify them in spring as they come up so you know that they're a flower, not a weed. And then as you get to know your plants, you'll know which ones you can thin out and either share if there are no jumping worms or just uh, throw in the compost pile or start a new garden. New England asters, probably the most popular of the asters, a great end to the season. These combine nicely with goldenrod. They tend to flop, especially in rich soils. So either prune them back early in the season, back to six inches throughout June, early July, for those of you further south, or plant some sturdier plants next to it, just like we saw at the National Arboretum to help hold them upright. Um, sedges. You know, interesting thing about sedges, and I'm going to pick up the pace here a little bit. Sedges will take some like it dry, some like it wet, some tolerate both of you seen. Look at those interesting seed heads on the Plains Oval Sedge. Three to five feet tall. This is a tall one. It takes it wet and dry, perfect in the center of the garden. So this would be great next to those New England asters. It would be next to great to some of those other plants. Um, in the center of the garden to help hold them upright. Blooms early in the season. And I think you've got, once you start gardening with some of these more subtle plants, you really appreciate those subtleties and you look for them and they really jump out after you once you start looking for them. Wild geraniums. If they are happy, they will be a wonderful ground cover. They bloom early in the season. The leaves tend to hold up throughout the season. Um, in bloom, they can be up to two feet tall. Um, wonderful, kind of a great start to the season. So when I see the wild geraniums blooming, I think oh, it's great. These are part to full shade plants. So we're moving more into the shade right now. These are woodland plants that you often see on the woodland edge uh, growing in those kind of situations. Wild columbine, it'll take sun, part sun to shade. Our native columbine is this one, orange and yellow combination with the flowers facing downward. And those spurs are filled with nectar. So these are perfect for hummingbirds and butterflies. And the seeds, the birds will eat. These do reseed readily. I have these in a garden area and um, I'm always kind of, thinning them out after a few years, but that's okay. You know, um, they really add a lot of interest and help support the pollinators and bring the hummingbirds to my bird feeding area. They like it moist to well drained to dry soil conditions. So pretty tolerant. If you have leaf miner, they're insects that leave little uh, serpentine stripes in the leaves. It won't hurt the plant. They just look unsightly or call them variegated. You can cut it back after flowering. That also prevents reseeding, which then you don't have the seeds for the bird, but you have fresh green growth. So you may wanna do a little bit of both. 
Big leaf aster. This is an aster that takes shade and wet soil conditions. So this is perfect for those of you growing a rain garden in partial shade or shade, and especially in heavier soils. It blooms in September. It's a couple feet tall, so it can really brighten that garden in the evening with these white flowers with just a hint of pink. And again, very shade tolerant, which most asters aren't. Heartleaf Golden Alexander. This is a plant I talk about not only for rain gardens, but it's great for um, wet gardens areas as well. It takes it wet, it takes it dry. It's a bloomer early in the season. You get that burst of yellow color when we're really dying for some color. Um, Heartleaf, you can see, gets its uh, common name by the shape of the leaves. Again, this is one that can take mesic moist soil conditions to drier conditions and full sun to shade. So very, very diverse. So again, this would be a great one around the edge of your rain garden or along the sides where it tends to be a bit drier. Long beaked sedge, look, and you can see where it gets the name, attractive seed heads. It blooms in May and June, followed by these seed heads. It takes it wet and dry. So another good one for those areas of the rain garden that tend to stay wet longer, but then once the rain stop, they dry out. Mist flower. I'm originally from Ohio and I was down um, for a family reunion in southern Ohio and my uncle's farm fields were filled with this mist flower. So this has a lot of sentimental value for me. Um, it may remind you a bit of uh, ageratum and Joe Pieweed, it's a eupatorium, which Joe Pieweed's been kind of changed, the name's been changed, but the flower is very similar, very attractive to butterflies and bees, and you may even find hummingbirds on these. Um, these are growing in full sun in my uncle's field, but really they prefer part sun to shade, wet to dry soil. So these will grow anywhere in your rain garden. They're a couple feet tall. These were growing amongst the field of grasses and they just, that blue stood out. It was wonderful. Just a nice welcome relief to the grass. And you can see in the lower left, that's colchicum autumn crocus, which flowers in the fall. So you can see this is a long bloomer. Zigzag goldenrod. This is one of the few goldenrods that does tolerate the shade and moist to dry soil conditions. It does spread, but um, again, if it's got equally assertive uh, partners in your garden, it sh you should be fine. Just keep an eye on it. Uh, one to three feet tall. Again, one that's great for shade to part shade and those wet to dry areas in the rain garden. A new one in the list this year is anemone, tall anemones. If you've grown anemones, these, this one blooms all summer long. And these remind me more of spring flowers than summer blooms. And then the seed heads that follow look like tufts of cotton. So it really adds interest throughout the remainder of the year. These like it moist, well-drained to dry soil conditions to be happy. Um, and a little bit of shade, especially if you have a hot location is definitely welcome to full shade as well. Virginia wild rye grass, look at those, very impressive. It does look like a rye grass that you would expect to see on a farm field, right? It looks great in your rain garden, adds some interesting texture. Those leaves are very broad, so make a nice backdrop for your other flowers. It's a summer bloomer, the seed heads persist into fall. It likes it wet, full sun to full shade condition, so very adaptable plant. So just a couple ideas to get you started growing asters with goldenrod. Look at that combination. Chicago Botanic Garden had a hillside with asters and goldenrod. It's no longer there, but it looked like a Monet planting. So just a great way to end the season, kind of the last hurrah for you and the pollinators. Gray-headed coneflower is, gray-headed coneflower tibida has those long elongated cones and the petals drooping. This is my friend's garden, Stacy and Ken's garden, a shout out to them. They have beautiful gardens, a hillside of native plantings. And that's their one cardinal flower that keeps coming back. And it's amongst, um, as I mentioned, the gray-headed coneflower and wild bergamot.
Early sunflower, we talked about um, growing well and look at it, it's a nice, it's taller than the wild bergamot and it makes a nice combination. They're equally assertive in the garden. Pale purple coneflower, notice the difference of that texture versus the regular purple coneflower. And here again, it's with wild bergamot, very adaptable. I find it, it's a little finer textured leaf wise as well as petal wise in the garden. Um, this is one of my favorite combinations. It's not a native goldenrod, it's fireworks goldenrod that tends not to spread with uh, lavender hyssop. Now I've heard it pronounced agastache, 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 and purple coneflower. So it bloomed midsummer into fall and what a nice combination. This was at Fox Valley Technical College. Again, gray-headed coneflower in here with some wild bergamot and some purple coneflower. And it, this is, um, just texture, texture, texture. Um, Prairie Blazing Star hasn't started to bloom yet, just getting ready to that vertical accent next to the butterfly weed with some bergamot on the side. Early sunflower with wild bergamot, just a nice combination of texture and color. Prairie Blazing Star, notice how it flowers from the top moving down, just kind of an interesting thing. And that color echoes the prairie blazing star color. So it helps to tie that whole planting together. This is at Midwest Ground Covers. They're a wholesaler that sells plants to retail outlets and the landscapers, but they have a gardens inspired by Pete Udoff. He's one of the designers of Lurie Garden. So you'll see a mix of cultivated plants as well as native plants here. But what I wanted you to see is the dots of color, the yellow and white that jump out at you, the more subtle blues and purple, the round seed heads of the alliums, even though they're past bloom, grab your attention, and how the grasses tie it all together. Hori Vervain with wild bergamot and some grasses. Purple prairie clover. Look at those unique flowers. Aren't those great? Um, and you want to plant them in mass to have an impact or just let them be kind of exclamation points in the garden. Lead plant on the right um, with some goldenrod as well. Um, this, I think, was taken at Rotary Arboretum. So if you're in Milwaukee area, visit the Urban Ecology Center. They have some nice natural plantings. And the Rotary Arboretum across, just across the parking lot has some great examples. They burn their prairie every couple of years. But you'll find some good examples if you're in the Milwaukee area. Burner Botanical Garden has a wonderful rain garden. Uh, if you're out in the Madison area, um, Obrick Botanic Garden. And if you're in Green Bay, Green Bay Botanic Garden, but more and more botanic gardens and arboretums are putting in native plantings and also rain gardens. So check with your local rain garden. You can see that lead plant kind of next to the pale purple coneflower and on either side, some black eyed Susan, some wild bergamot. Please join me for some upcoming webinars tomorrow night for managing water um, on your property, April 5th. So we'll talk about not just rain gardens, but rain barrels, rain gardens, growing healthy lawns and landscapes to help absorb the water in ways that you can keep water where it falls and out of the basement and out of the storm sewer, or at least help do that. How to plant your rain garden on May 12th. I'm gonna throw in some ornamental plants on that night as well, just to give you some ideas if you wanna add a little burst of color before those natives come into their own. And visit my website. There are more webinars like tomorrow night is bird gardening and other topics. Just check BelindaMyers.com. And if you're in the Milwaukee Metro Sewage District, the spring plant sales open now. They have great prices on native plants up to 50% off because the goal is to get you to plant rain gardens to help keep water in your landscape and out of the storm sewer. I would recommend you order now. I just heard from my friends at Milorganite in Milwaukee Metro Sewage District that they have been able to get a second truck for delivery. They're hoping that the sale lasts. She was like through your March webinar. So that would be tonight. So um, order early. Okay. We've talked about plant selection. Take a look at the handout, the notes you took tonight, your plan that you put together last week. Um, put your order in early to make sure that you get it. And if you're not in the MMSD um, uh, service area, check with your local garden center and your 
favorite garden catalogs. There are a lot of nurseries like Prairie Nursery, uh, uh, Prairie Moon Nursery that sell native plants and seeds. So even if you're not in the area, there are they are available um, for you to use in your garden. I mentioned, check out my website, melindamyers.com. I have in-person appearances are happening now. And also I'm continuing to do webinars to stay in touch. Um, I do Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter, YouTube. I'm working on Instagram. I need to improve it. So please stay connected. And I know some of you have sent questions. I'm working my way through that as well. So please be patient. And last but not least, help me grow gardeners. This is my grandson, Sammy, and I have a downspout. I think I mentioned this if you joined me last week that leads into this garden. But when we get heavy rains, most of it's absorbed through my sandy soil, but some of it was running off into the sidewalk. So he likes to dig. I put him to work. We dug out a trench, lined it with landscape fabric, filled it with uh, stone. And it was a good way to put his excess energy to work. And he loves to dig. We know gardening makes us feel good help inspire someone else, someone inspired you, whether it's a youngster in your life, a young family, a new rain gardener, maybe team up with a neighbor and, and help each other as you start your rain gardens. And we all know we feel better. My goal is to grow a kinder and gentler world, one garden and gardener at a time, and I'll need your help. And thanks again to Fresh Coast Guardians and MMSD for sponsoring this web webinar. Their goal is to help improve water quality, keep water on our landscape where it's needed, and we all need to be part of the solution. So you've already started by planting a rain garden and getting it planted this year. And please contact Fresh Coast Guardians for more information. There's a link on your handout. Now I'm gonna turn it back to Beth and um, we'll handle any questions. I went a little long, sorry. Get me talking That's about okay. plants. <laughs> and get me talking about plants and uh, I don't stop. So happy to answer your questions. Excellent. It looks like we have 11 in the Q&A, so we'll go through those and then we'll Perfect. call it an evening. Okay, um, so Heidi had a question. It said, can common wilt milkweed be transplanted? We have it growing in our pasture and I'd like to move some to our yard. It can be challenging. What I found when I've tried to move it, here's the good news. If you take the rhizome, so milkweed spreads, common milkweed spreads by rhizomes and rhizomes are really stems that grow underground. And if you dig one up, you'll notice they're starting to sprout. And so you'll probably have really good luck moving those rhizomes more than trying to take the main plant. So when you dig the plant, take as much of that underground stem as you can, and that should help. Um, and yes, I'm trying to move mine to where I want it to grow. It unfortunately, Fortunately, decides it wants to grow everywhere. I have plenty of space, so I, I'm trying to get it to coexist a little better with my other plants. But yes, those rhizomes are pretty, um, they'll take, they should take off for you. Awesome. Um, Natalia asks, are all of the plants you mentioned this evening native plants? Yes, unless I said it was a cultivar, but all everything I showed you were all truly native, no native cultivars. And that's what's on your handout as well. I don't think I mentioned, the only thing I mentioned was the fireworks goldenrod. That's not on your plant list. That was just in one of the combinations, but everything else is a uh, pure native plant. And that's what's th available through the rain garden plant sale, but what you'll find from a lot of your native plant providers. Excellent. Um, Mary, in speaking of the handout, we did post it multiple times. Thank you. The comments. So if you scroll back up, you can download it. Um, we will also email it back again in a couple of days when we send the link to this recording so you can reference um, Melinda's great handout because it's so helpful. Um, Mary asks, I planted my rain garden last fall. If I have bare spots where I think I planted a plant, should I replace it, wait another year? Love these webinars. You know, thank you, Mary. And I'm one of those people that waits probably longer than anyone. Um, I, you wouldn't need to wait a whole year. I don't know if MMSD, if, if you're buying your plants through MMSD, I'm not sure they're having a fall plant sale. Um, I would give them time. You might want to buy plants early, whether you're buying, buying from a garden center or ma mail order or through the plant sale, because with all our new gardeners, welcome, 18.3 new mil million, 18.3 million new gardeners 
gardeners in the last couple of years, yay, um, everybody's ordering plants and a lot of people are going sustainable and native. So I would order what you think you might need. You can always leave it in the container, give those plants time. If they're not showing any signs of life by June in our area, you should start seeing things by mid-June, depending on the weather. You know, if it's a cool spring, it can be later. If it's a warm spring, it's earlier. So you might want to order. If you're like me, you can always find another place for that plant or give it to someone else starting a rain garden or fill in a different void. So I would, I would give them a little time. Be especially hot since you planted in the fall. And with this cold and warm and cold and warm, not only have we had in Wisconsin, but I was working in Maryland a couple weeks ago. Boy, it was 80 degrees and then it was dropping back and I think they were getting snow. So um, that can cause frost heaving. So you might want to take a look at your garden, especially since you planted in the fall. If anything's pushed out of the soil, um, gently push it back in so those roots aren't exposed. But good question, Mary. I would order just in case, have them on hand. Um, you could always heal them in somewhere and then plug them in as needed. Awesome. That's good for me to know too. I okay. <laughs> Beth planted one last year. So you have a mm -hmm. rain garden um, enthusiast with us tonight. Yeah. I watched all these. I got to work all these great webinars. And said, <laughs> you know what? We got to do that too. Um, and you look, found our young digger who's going to help with the new one. <laughs> you got it. Yep. You saw him. Sassy kid. <laughs> uh, Mary would also like to know they're thinking of adding a little extra berm on the downslope edge of their rain garden. What plants are good to plant on the berm to keep it? from eroding. You know, that prairie uh, smoke is an excellent. The wild petunia will definitely fill in that area. The strawberry is another one because it will take full sun and part shade and it spreads. I forgot to mention, if you've grown strawberries, you know they spread. That spreads by runners, just like many of the cultivated strawberries do. So I think any of those that take it dry, so prairie smoke, the wild petunia and the strawberries would be some good ones. And you bring up a good point. I, I will mention again at the planting is having that barrier, not only so you can mow up to it, but keep the grass and the weeds out of your rain garden and the berm helps keep the water in the rain garden. So planting, it's a great idea, as you mentioned, Mary, for erosion control as well. Excellent. Okay. Um, Heidi started some wild lupine this year. I'm in zone six. Can it be planted out now? Take a look at what's happening in your garden. Um, and first of all, anything you start from seed, if you started them, I'm guessing inside under lights, you're going to need to harden them off just like you would planting your tomatoes out. So gradually introduce them to the bright sunlight, the cooler temperatures. So you could start that hardening off process. It takes a couple of weeks. So that would put you into April. And then and then they'd be ready to go. What I always say is look at what's growing in naturally or existing gardens. And that's a good clue when you can plant. But if it's growing indoors or you get bare root plants that start to grow, you need to pot them up. Um, if they've got leaves on them, gradually introduce them to the cold and then you should be fine if you're in zone six. But see what's happening around and base it on your weather conditions too. All right, Jax asks, would lemon verbena do well in a rain garden? Um, it's very, lemon verbena, um, lemon balm is very aggressive. Lemon verbena, depending on where you live, is not reliably hardy up here in Wisconsin. So it would be kind of an annual, I think I'm remembering this right, lemon verbena, lemon balm will grow and spread and take over. I grew lemon verbena and it, it's not a reliable perennial for zone five and four. If you're in a milder climate, it might be. I would use it, it likes, it likes moist, well-drained soils. So if you're gonna do it, I would do it kind of not in the base, but around the edges, either towards the top or on the sides. I found it to be very drought tolerant in my garden once established. All right. Um, Maria ordered Heath Aster from the MMSD sale. Can you say anything about it? Heath Aster is one of the better ones from, and I didn't see it on their list, so maybe that was from last year. Heath Aster is Chicago Botanic Garden evaluated native and cultivated asters, and Heath Aster's was one of the 
the asters they recommended. He felt that it performed best in Chicago's in heavy clay soil. So if you're in the Milwaukee metro or an urban area, you probably have some heavy, not the best soil. Even after amending, it's a lot of work. Um, it will take light shade to full sun. Um, you might need to do a little trimming or give it some sturdy neighbors, but it really is one that performs well and tends to be long lived as terms of asters go. And on my handout, you may notice the name is a little different than some asters have been redivided and renamed. And so I try, don't always, always make it to use the most recent, but you'll find asters sold as asters because I think the growers and the breeders are like, people will know what these are if we call them asters. So Heath Aster is an excellent one, nice, light, airy texture. So good choice. Okay, um, Jimmy has a really large yard. So they're looking to make a 1,000 to 2,000 square foot rain garden. How wow. fast do the plants spread and fill in? He's trying to determine how many plants to order. So um, in if you look at even if you aren't in the MMSD district, one of the helpful tools they have is they talk about how many square feet each plant fills. Um, you may, the spacing recommendations on the handout are pretty conservative, meaning I'm trying to get you off to a good start. I did a 182 square foot garden um, I shared last week and I put the plants about a foot apart and the guy working with me goes, these seem close and I'm like, we're banking on success here, knowing that, you know, it's a rain garden, they're small plants, we got to get them off to a good start. So in, I, I have a new book out, Midwest Gardener's Handbook, but if you go to the website, you can find a calculator. And if you punch in the square footage that a plant takes, you know, a foot and a half, and you punch that into the formula, it'll kick out how many plants you need. So worst case scenario, you need quite a few. Um, if you give them two square feet, you know, that's going to give you a lot of space in between. They'll eventually fill in, but you'll have more bare space and a little more weeding to do. With that large of a garden, you're going to want to put a path in between. So how's that for avoiding doing math on the spot? <laughs> um, but if you have trouble finding it, just do, um, I've done landscape calculators and found them online. I have a, a calculator in the back of all my books I've done, my Minnesota, Wisconsin, getting started and month by month guide. Um, I can Xerox a copy and shoot it out to you, the calculator, so you can punch it in. And then you can look at how many plants need take up this space and how many take up that space. So on the hand, it'll tell you the spacing. There's like a factor you use to calculate that. So Jimmy, info at melindamyers.com. And I know I'm behind on answering some of the questions from last week, be patient. Um, info at melindamyers.com, just say plant spacing calculator or what ordering plant calculator. And I'll copy that page if you don't have my book and send that off to you, email it off to you. Or I could do snail mail if that's easier, but email will go faster. Awesome. Um, I've been trying to drop in their comments on um, your website link, the link to Thank your book. You. Um, Thank so people you. can find those in there. And then we will certainly include that information in our follow-up email if you're not able to write it down or click on it because I understand we, these webinars, you get busy listening. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we want you to do. So that's why mm -hmm. the handouts are so extensive because I feel like it's my shot at helping you out. So there are lots Absolutely. of links too. All right. Um, how often is it recommended to burn off a prairie of flowers and grasses? So if you're in the city, it may be never. Um, if you are in an area where you can burn, typically um, the Rotary Arboretum, they burn every three years. Um, it's usually like every second or every third year. Mowing is another option if you can't burn. Um, and that's what a lot of people are doing, especially in urban and suburban areas, or even with concern about um, air quality and things. So if you're in a, in a prairie, Prairie Nursery in Westfield, Wisconsin, no matter where you buy your plants, their website has really excellent information on prairie gardening and managing and developing a prairie. So he talks about soil prep and managing weeds before you plant to reduce the problem. He talks about mowing 
um, when to mow to manage certain types of weeds and, and when and how to burn. So check that out, Prairie Nursery, I think it's .com. Uh, but if you do Prairie Nursery, Nursery Westfield, Wisconsin, you'll get there as well. But he's got lots of helpful information um, to help you manage, plant and manage um, and maintain a prairie as well. Okay, um, let's do two more questions. Okay. So Marie would like to ask, will native plants survive if area is sprayed with weed killer? Not if the weed killer, well, no. So most broadly, most weed killers applied by a lawn care company, or if you get a weed and feed, or, you know, a weed be gone, they kill broadleaf plants. And so most of the things that have the pretty, well, all the things that had the pretty flowers are broadleaf plants. So those weed killers will hit them. The grass plants in the sedges will probably tolerate, they may experience some damage, but would survive. Um, the other thing, the other concern, especially with a rain garden, and I probably didn't make this clear enough, is that rain garden is capturing all the chemicals off the roof, the hard surfaces, and if any weed killer hasn't had a chance to absorb into the soil below, some of that may migrate into your rain garden. So avoiding or minimizing the use of weed killers, maybe spot treating if you really need to use them, uh, using more organic products. So those organic products can damage the good plants as well. So if you can try to create at least a barrier around a barrier of grass that is not treated with a broadleaf weed killer, um, avoiding the area where the water runs off, if at all possible. Um, a lot of them have to be watered in, but if you keep your lawn healthy, and that's one thing we're going to talk about at the managing stormwater, is if you keep your lawn healthy, you can eliminate weed control or at least really minimize the weeds in your lawn um, just by uh, fertilizing properly and mowing high and mowing often and doing all those things to grow a healthy lawn, it'll outcompete the weeds. So it, I would avoid the weed killers. Great question, Marie, because a lot, it, what you do to your lawn is gonna impact that rain garden. Great question. Awesome. All right. And then the last question we'll take for this evening from Mary. I thought great blue lobelia was an annual. Does that seed okay in the Milwaukee area? It's a perennial. And you might be thinking there's um, some, there's a wide range of blue, uh, lobelia, but great blue lobelia is a perennial. It's hardy to zone five. Um, I've seen it in gardens surviving. I don't have it in my garden yet. I just planted it. So I'm hoping <laughs> it came through the winter okay. But um, great blue lobelia is a hardy perennial for Southeast. I think it's zone five, it's hardy too. So yeah, it's a one of the perennials. So that's good news. And it does receive Seed, but it, the plants will return every year as well. Um, but it doesn't recede aggressively. It tends to form dense colonies, but not kind of take over a whole garden bed. Awesome. Well, I just want to, again, thank you so much for your time this evening, Melinda, and your expertise. This has been wonderful as always. Um, again, to all of our attendees that are still listening in, we will email you in just a couple of days. Once we get Melinda's um, program uploaded to our YouTube channel, you can actually catch last week's program on our YouTube channel. It will include all the links, handouts, and everything from those previous sessions to you um, in just a couple of days. Um, we did put the registration link for Melinda next program with us which well, is in early you. April um, it's about managing the rainwater on your property so we'll see you in April again Melinda you have a great night thanks you too take care All good right, night everyone you. good night everyone